Hey, I'm Rick Croslin, and I'm here today. I'm a teacher in Wayne Township, and I love science. And uh, we're going to be showing you some, well, what I think are some crazy things today. And I got a couple other teachers that are joining me. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Allison. Allison, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Kempers. I'm a teacher at Wayne Township, teaching preschool and early childhood education. I'm also a Butler student in the EPPSP program. And um, I love going on uh, fossil hunts and looking for mushrooms and also cracking open geodes. We're excited you're here today, and this will be a fun time for all, everyone. Thank you. Hey, I'm Keith Ramsey. I teach for Wayne Township. Absolutely love chemistry and physics. I'm a graduate from CSULA, and we're hoping to show you some discrepant events here where the mind can't believe what the eyes behold. I hope you enjoy it. So, um, discrepant event, that's a word you may not have heard, but a discrepant event, I learned about this word a long time ago. It's something that when you see it, your eyes tell you one thing, but your mind tells you something else. And so, that's what we're going to do. A couple of these projects called discrepant events. And uh, the first one I want to show you is, I have a, a, a magnet here. I have two magnets. And you know that magnets, let me switch cameras here so you can see it. You know that two magnets, uh, well, they, uh, uh, they actually will attach to each other. So I can pull them apart and they will come together. So that's, you expect that. But did you know that a magnet can also attach to a rock? So here is a magnet attached to a rock. So you might think, I didn't know a magnet would do that. What's going on that a magnet can attach to a rock? And so what, what that is, is that, that should make your mind think about that just a little bit more. Uh, let's, I have a magnet set up here. Let me see if you can see this really good. This is my, uh, I like to call this my flying nail. So I have a magnet right here. And if you look, one, two, three, I can make this, mag this nail float in air. Now that's kind of cool. But if you look really carefully, you can see that I've attached it to a string right here. And there is a magnet up here, and this magnet is attracted to this iron nail. So magnets are attracted to other magnets, and they're attracted to iron. So what's going to happen if I put my finger through here? You, uh, predict, is it going to go down? Or it probably will. Well, let's just find out. And look, that magnetism went right through my finger. What if I used uh, something like a, a, a piece of a wood? What do you think if I put wood through here? Make a prediction, up or down? Here we go, ready? Oh, I can't believe it. So wood is not affected by it. My finger's not affected by it. What about some hard plastic? Here's some plastic, I put plastic through it. This is starting to be kind of weird. Maybe this invisible magnetic force is going through everything. Here's some aluminum. Aluminum's metal. I thought magnets and metal, let's see what happens, ready? Huh. It even goes through aluminum, and I have a, a big, thick piece of aluminum. Surely it will fall now. I can spin it, no, but it goes right through, and even through aluminum. This is getting to be weird. A piece of glass, it goes through glass. This magnetism is really kind of weird. Uh, uh, here's another metal, copper. I have copper right here, and let's see what happens on the copper, ready? Uh, you may want to click your uh, camera if you want to make mine bigger. There's a way to do that. And Allison, how do you tell them how to do that while I get this ready? Sure. I just typed it in the chat box. But if you okay. click on speaker view in the upper right corner, you can make Mr. Croslin's presentation larger so you can see. Also, yeah. another housekeeping tip, too. Please type your questions into the chat box as, you, as we have our presentation here. At the end, we'll have a brief Q&A. Thank you. And so I put this copper through, it stays up with copper. I'm really starting to think that now this is brass, an alloy of two different metals. It's very heavy and, and no. I even have my ring that's made out of gold from uh, Egypt and this gold, I wonder what gold will do. Let's see, uh, oh my goodness. It's not affected by gold or brass or uh, plastic or wood. My last metal is a piece of lead, lead. You know, that protects, uh, Superman from kryptonite, but lead, very malleable, very thick, very heavy, very dangerous. You know what, in your body? 
You see, there's these invisible lines of force and these invisible lines of force, you can't see them, but maybe I can cut them. Let's see what happens, ready? Did I ruin that magnet or did I not? No, in fact, as you can see, <laughs> uh, the magnet still works. And so your mind should be thinking, why, why, why did that work? And it's really not the cut I did. There must be something. Let's see if I can do it with the back of the scissors, see if it works the same way. Yes, it does. So there's something in these scissors, there's something in these scissors that interferes with the magnetic force. And that something happens to be uh, iron. And so iron does that. So that's just, you can make one of these. Uh, if you go online uh, on, on my web, uh, uh, YouTube channel. There's a way to make these with a paper cup, cup and uh, mm -hmm. a paper clip, and they're pretty easy to make. So this next one has to do with uh, water, and uh, it's kind of fun. Let's see, can you see this one pretty good if I put the water right here? So the water, I got some water right here, and let me switch cameras to a better camera so you can see this just a little bit better. And we're going to try a trick that, or a science concept that you probably have seen before, and it kind of goes like this. Here we go. Ready? Uh, what I have is the water and I'm going to put in here a little bit of, uh, here we go. Just a little bit of water in this cup. And if I do this right, I don't make a mess. I put it here, flip it over, one, two, three. And if I flip it over and let go, we're gonna get Something that's pretty cool. The water stays in there. So what's going on? What's going on? The water wants to come down because of gravity, but air pressure wants to get in there. And so there's a little bit of a vacuum and the water molecules like to hold on to each other. So it stops it from going. But that's not too big of a discrepant event. Let me show you this one. So I have this guy right here, which is a, uh, a jar with some window screen on it. And if I put water in it, I can pour the water through. You can see that the water's going through, right? Now, what's going to happen if I put the lid over here? And you can try this at home too. And I'm going to flip it over and say, oh, this is the part that's kind of dangerous, at least for wet if you have a computer. <laughs> and if you notice, look at that, it's still hanging. But here's the fun part check this out. I'm going to lift the lid off of this and see what happens. One, two, three. Did you see that? The water didn't come out of the bottom because there's a lot of pressure right there, but that pressure, that pressure underneath there is actually being divided by all of those little squares. So the, instead of one big pressure of water wanting to come down, we have it divided in these little squares and the water molecules can squeeze together. And I'll tell you, you actually have this at your house. Uh, you, can, uh, you can actually go and, uh, uh, your sink, and if you notice that your sink is, uh, your sink has a, a faucet that comes down, turn on your water and the water comes instantly out of your faucet. Why doesn't it take a whole bunch of time to go up the, the neck? Because there's already water sitting there and there's a little screen just holding back the water. If I tip it a little bit, we're gonna get a, uh, an unbalanced force. But if I bring it even, it's balanced and that's kind of cool. You can do that yourself with just some screen and uh, a jar and some water. But this next one is even kind of weirder. Uh, so I have my uh, periodic table of elements and I got a, uh, a cup and what's gonna happen, this one's dangerous. I got, I'm gonna pour some water in here and see what happens. It's only dangerous because I don't wanna get water all, all over my computer today. Let's see what happens, ready? Watch carefully. One, two, three, I pour all the water in there. Okay, just like I did before. And I'm gonna put this, uh, oh, this cup, you, you see the water is still, the water is still coming out. Let's see if we can try it again with this. I'm gonna pour that water into here. Ready? And it's still going. And now I'm gonna try uh, putting this over it and putting this, flipping it. One, two, three, and over my head. I hate this part and Uh, what happened to the water? The water disappeared. Um, well, that's a discrepant event because my mind was thinking I was going to get soaked in wet, but I didn't. 
Uh, let me show you one more. Uh, this one you can also do. And what you'll need is like either some cans of uh, 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 vegetable cans or some glasses. And I brought some glasses today. And let's see, let me switch cameras here. I'll get the right camera. Um, one more camera, here we go. So I got my glasses set up right here. And let me bounce back a little bit further. Here we go. One glass, two glass. You need three glasses plus one for the middle. And if you can see these, let me see if I get this guy right here and here. And I got some knives. And what you want to do is set these up so that uh, I want to make sure that that is not touching. So there we go. Let's move these up. So you see how that is farther apart. And let's put this one here. And it's farther apart. These won't hang in here. Here we go. And then um, let's see this guy right here. So you notice that none of these are close enough. None of these are close enough to be touching, right? One, two, three. Three glasses. Let me move this one in just a little bit. So how can I fix a way that I can get these? See this? Uh, move it. This won't match. So to set this up, make sure that your glasses are farther apart than your knife. And we got to find a way to get this one to stay in the middle right here. So let's try this. Here we go. Hmm, let's see. If I put this here like this, and then I put this one here like this, and fall in that third one. But what if I can use something called tinsel strength, where I put this one like this, and then this one like this, and uh, put them all together, kind of like in a triangle like this. And if I hook them on a triangle like this, one, two, three, they hold each other together, even though they're farther apart. Now, the big question is, can I put this glass on top? Yes, that actually worked. That is so cool that that did that. So it's like it's almost, it's almost standing by itself because I have got these three knives interlocked, and they're using the strength of each other to lock in. And that is another discrepant event. So I'd like to uh, switch over now to uh, uh, a friend of mine and a teacher, Mr. Keith Ramsey, and he's got several demonstrations he's going to show you. And uh, Mr. Ramsey, it's all yours. So one of my favorite discrepant events, you'll see this in magic shows a lot, where they'll create smoke out of nowhere. And if you've ever seen reruns of the sitcom I Dream of Genie, they make all of this white smoke and then the genie appears. And people often ask, well, how can the people on the set breathe all of that smoke? Well, check it out. What I've got here is that very same discrepant event. And the essential question is, where does the smoke come from? So I'm going to add this small pellet of manganese dioxide to hydrogen peroxide. And let's see what happens. I've got my gloves on. This is a very exothermic reaction. Look at all of that smoke. You'd think it would make me cough, but it doesn't. That's because this is really a decomposition reaction where the hydrogen peroxide is releasing pure oxygen. So it's completely safe for me to breathe and it just keeps reacting. Who would think that that little pellet of manganese dioxide would act as a catalyst that's this powerful? It just keeps going. And this is what they use on the set of I Dream of Genie. It's just amazing. So the next demonstration that I'd like to show you where the brain just can't believe what the eyes see has to do with the disappearing acts that magicians often use. And in this vanishing act, I'm gonna take a little bit of tin foil and I'm gonna add it to this flask. And most people would predict, well, it's just gonna make a splash. But really what's in this flask here is hydrochloric acid. So I'm gonna drop this tin foil in and it's gonna vanish, but not right away. At first, it just makes a splash. Now I'm gonna take a balloon and I'm gonna fashion it over the mouth of the flask. And one of the essential questions in this reaction is, where does that aluminum foil go? But another question is, why does the balloon inflate? Now at first, while the aluminum foil is in there, what's happening is you'll start to have a little bit of bubbles. 
and the veneer on the aluminum foil, it starts to be corroded by the hydrochloric acid. And when all that veneer is gone, it starts to react. And I'm gonna set this here with another disappearing act that I'm gonna do simultaneously with this penny. This is another vanishing act where I'm gonna use not hydrochloric acid, but I'm gonna use nitric acid over here. And I'm gonna add this penny, which is made of copper and zinc, and I'm gonna put it in this beaker here. And right away, you can start seeing the penny starts to change into kind of this greenish color. And I'm gonna cover it with this Petri dish because as this vanishing act occurs, it starts to release nitrogen dioxide, that brown gas that you see in there. I call this my phantom penny. The essential question is where does the penny go? It vanishes. This is another decomposition reaction. Pretty soon that penny is gonna be completely gone. Meanwhile, in my other vanishing act over here, you can see something happening. I'm starting to see a cloud form of vapor around my tin foil, and something is happening to this balloon. It's starting to inflate. Well, one question is, why does the balloon inflate? The other question is gonna be, where does the tin foil go? It's going to vanish, just like my pen. This is a great vanishing act where the mind can't believe what the eyes behold. Now this next demonstration is something that I just love to show students. And this is a great reaction that you can do at home. All you need for this is just a bottle, some baking soda, we know this is sodium bicarbonate. Coat the bottom of your bottle with the sodium bicarbonate and slowly add vegetable oil. And as you pour in the vegetable oil, try to do this at an angle so it doesn't make gaps in the sodium bicarbonate in the baking soda on the bottom. The next step is just take some vinegar, pour it in another glass, and add a little bit of food coloring to the vinegar. This makes it look much better. This is a green for today, but you can use any color. And as you add this, it's gonna go down and it's gonna touch that sodium bicarbonate. We know the vinegar is acetic acid, and you're gonna make your own lava lamp. But this lava lamp doesn't have bubbles that rise because of convection. These bubbles rise because they're less dense than the oil. So I'm gonna add this. You can watch it go all the way down. And the taller the bottle, the better this looks. Now what's happening here is not an exothermic reaction. This is actually endothermic because in this reaction, this decomposition reaction, what you're doing is you're actually breaking down the sodium bicarbonate and it's becoming um, sodium acetate down here. And the acetic acid comes down here, it becomes carbonic acid and it releases carbon dioxide gas. And you can see that gas trapped up in these bubbles. As the bubbles rise, they burst at the surface and then they come back down. This is a great homemade lava lamp. It's safe because it's not exothermic. It doesn't release heat. It's actually very cool to the touch. It actually reduces the temperature. Easy to make and it's a great demonstration. Let's go back to our vanishing act. Over here, if you take a look, the tin foil is almost gone and it's very hot to the touch. That's because this is an exothermic decomposition. Let's go back to our paint. I'm gonna put my glove on because believe it or not, this beaker is really hot. Now, if you get really close, you zoom in, you'll see that there's no penny. The penny's gone. Where did it go? It's been de 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 decomposed. It's been broken down into smaller parts. We've got some water here. We have some nitrogen dioxide. That's this purple gas, this, this brown gas that you see at the surface. The penny is gone. This is a great discrepant event where the brain just can't make sense of what the eyes see. Now, what I'd like to do is just go back to our vanishing tinfoil over here because this balloon, it reminds me of the Hindenburg. If you remember, the Hindenburg was a blimp that was filled with hydrogen gas. And we don't make blimps with hydrogen gas anymore because hydrogen is extremely combustible. Now we make blimps with helium gas because helium has two protons, hydrogen only has one. 
So hydrogen is less dense, it has less mass than helium. It's obviously more buoyant, but it's dangerous because of the combustion rate. It will, will catch on fire very quickly. And we wanna demonstrate that with this demonstration here. So all you have to do to demonstrate the combustion rate of hydrogen gas is take this balloon, because guess what's happening? My tin foil has vanished. It's gone. Where did it go? Well, it decomposed. It broke down the hydrochloric acid into pure hydrogen gas. And so to demonstrate the combustion of that gas, I'm just gonna twist this balloon like this so I don't lose any of it. I'm gonna pull it up a little bit. I'm gonna detach it from the mouth of my flask. And I'm gonna ignite the gas inside this balloon. Check it out. Did you see that fire? That was pure hydrogen gas that just combusted before your eyes. This is why you never wanna get into a blimp that's filled with hydrogen. Keep those helium balloons afloat. Now this next demonstration that I wanna show you again involves a little bit of fire. And magicians will often create fire out of nowhere. People are thinking, how did that happen? Right here, I have a small dish that has a mixture of potassium, chlorate, and sugar, a very small amount. And over here, I've got 98% region sulfuric acid. I am just gonna put one drop of acid on this compound, and we're gonna see what happens. Now, I'm gonna ventilate our room a little bit. And I'm gonna put this on the floor for safety. And we're gonna find out what happens with just a drop of sulfuric acid. Because I got a feeling that your brain is not gonna believe what your eyes are gonna see. Check this out, one drop of sulfuric acid. Fire out of nowhere! How did that happen? Amazing decomposition. So in that reaction, we're using sugar is the engine that oxidizes with the potassium chlorate and releases all of this energy out of nowhere. An amazing discrepant event. Another demonstration I'd like to share with you while time allows is a double- Keith, we have about reaction. two minutes, Keith. Okay, Thank and you. this involves potassium iodide and lead nitrate. When students look at this, this one's kind of cloudy, this one's kind of clear. You wouldn't think that if I combine these two, that it would create something completely different. A double replacement reaction is where two compounds come together and they completely trade each other's elements evenly. Check this out. I'm gonna pour one into the other. Here it goes. Look at that. It's like magic mustard out of nowhere. Clear to yellow. Amazing. The mind can't believe what the eyes behold. I hope you enjoyed today's demonstrations. <laughs> Those were great. <laughs> so let's see, let me get back here. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Ramsey. You can see more of his demonstrations uh, on his YouTube channel, Ramsey Land. I, I think that's in the chat section right there. And uh, he uh, teaches sixth grade at Bridgeport Elementary. Those kids are pretty lucky to have them. So a discrepant event makes you see something and makes you think, what's going on? And uh, one of the easiest uh, science public demonstrations that you ever have seen before happened in the Royal Science Academy, uh, the Science Institute in London by a scientist named Michael Faraday. And Michael Faraday spent a lot of time giving lectures to the public about the combustion of a candle. Let me see if I can get my, this thing lit right here. And so at Christmas time, he invited the public in and I have my candle going here, if I can get there. There's my candle, oh, there's my light and my candle. And so you might think, if I ask you to make some observations, you'll say, oh, it's a candle, it's in the candlestick. But a scientist would say, no, those are inferences because you might say this is white, it has a flame, but if you watch carefully, this is the discrepant event. Ready? You see, 
what you thought you saw didn't happen. Or what happened, maybe you don't believe what happened. So, was this a candle? Was that a wick? It was burning. Hey, I hope you enjoy these uh, science demos, and uh, I would love for any of your questions. Allison, uh, Ms. Uh, Kempers from our Wayne School, if you have any questions for us, we're ready to go. If it's for me, I'll answer. If it's for Mr. Ramsey, we'll connect over to him. Sure. Um, thank you, too. Thank you, Mr. Croslin. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey, for an awesome uh, presentation. One question we have in the chat box is from Lori. Um, how long will the endothermic lava lamp last, Mr. Ramsey? Let me uh, switch cameras and uh, uh, go over virtually to Mr. Ramsey at his lab, if I do this yes. right. Hold on, Mr. Ramsey. I see if I can get you connected. Wrong camera. Go ahead. That's a terrific question. And I've got the lava lamp right here. I can see that most of the acetic acid is done reacting and most of my carbon dioxide bubbles are starting to slow down. You see kind of a great suspension effect where you've got little bubbles that are suspended. I would say seven minutes after the demonstration. You'll have big bubbles rise and fall for a good three minutes. Um, with this demonstration. But after a while, it does start to die down as you uh, run out of carbon dioxide gas. But um, great demonstration for about three minutes. Thanks. Uh, we have one more. Uh, was, that, was that the candle? Yes, was that a candle? Was That's that a, a candle? Question. Was that a candle? <laughs> Did it look like a candle? Uh, maybe this will give you a hint. And maybe this will give you a hint. These are almond slivers, a sliver of almond, which has oil in it, which will burn. And then this was a, uh, a potato that I carved in the shape. Because one thing that scientists want to avoid is what's called bias. Bias is when you go into an experiment thinking, oh, that's a candle. Oh, yeah, I can see the candlestick. It's white. It's cylindrical. So that is one thing. Uh, uh, that you may want to avoid when you are being a scientist. Bias. Is that it on our questions? It looks like that's all the questions in the chat Nobody box. Nobody even wanted to know what happened to the, the water that went into the cup. Well, it's a mystery. <laughs> Guys, thank you for coming. Uh, I know that if uh, uh, we have two more lessons today, I'm going to do another one on airplanes and one on the fishes of the Amazon. But don't forget to check out our guest speaker at noon, which is uh, Camille Shear, who is the 2020 Miss America, who's also a scientist. And to talk about decomposition, she won the talent aspect of her uh, ceremony by doing the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And she made elephant toothpaste. So, hey, thanks for coming. I know you have choices. Uh, check out the chat. If there's no more questions, uh, we got like one more minute. I'll hang out. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next time. Rick, Thank someone, you, Skippers. Yeah, Rick, somebody did say, where did, where did the water go? Where did the water go? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Um, I had put a white chemical in the bottom of the cup. And that white chemical is, I'll show it to you. It is sodium polyacrylate. Sodium polyacrylate, but you know it if you have a younger brother or sister. It's the stuff that's put in diapers that absorbs water. And so it's also used in deserts in certain countries where, where the water, it rains really quick and the water will rush away from any plants. They put that in the soil around the plant. When they water it, it absorbs the water and keeps the water there for plants to use. Thanks for asking. So it's still in there if you take a look. See you guys next time. Thank you.